Um, Mark Vigley is a professor of architecture and Dean Emeritus at Columbia University. His books include Passing Through Architecture, The Ten Years of Gordon Matta Clark, Cutting Matta Clark, The An Architecture Investigation, R.V. Human, Notes on an Archaeology of Design, co-written with Beatrice Colomino, Buckminster Fuller, Inc., Architecture in the Age of Radio, Constance, New Babylon, The, the Hyper-Architecture of Desire, White Walls, Designer Dresses, The Fashioning of Mod Modern Architecture, and Derrida's Haunt, The Architecture of Deconstruction, which is actually one of the first books I read as serious theory during my undergraduate studies. So I'm delighted to welcome Mark Vigley, and please take it away. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, it's super nice to be with you. Thanks for the kind invitation and to be with uh, the wonderful Eric and the amazing Francesca in this panel is, is a delight. And uh, also to follow Alejandro, who uh, I have such respect for, um, because if you talk about conservation, I think conserving brain power in our field is very important. And so I would consider Alejandro's brain something to protect with some kind of envelope. Um, but, you know, really, uh, architects are thinkers and, and, and Alejandro so, so much shows that. And maybe you can see there's a lot of resonance between, between, between uh, his polemic and, and mine. But I go fast. Um, it's funny how the gap, by the way, went so slow. Like maybe it's one of the effects of Zoom that actually regular time just becomes uh, impossibly long. And maybe we actually... Um, more comfortable with Zoom than we uh, pretend. Anyway, the theme, uh, exactitude. Wow, what a great subject. There is so much talk about exactitude in architecture today. So that's a bit strange, right? That we will have a conference about exactitude, but actually exactitude, if you, if you hold your ear open, it's, it's everywhere in the field of architecture and, in, and in, the, in the world. So also, of course, this is why it's great to have the exactitude as a theme, but let's say the first symptom would be something like, how can we use that word all the time and only now um, do the colleges get together to, to have this conference? I mean, what do I mean by so much, so much uh, talk about uh, exactitude? I mean, all of the thousands of elements in even the simplest buildings are seen today to be defined by ever more precise computation in design, modeling, analysis, testing, selection, sourcing, budgeting, specification, fabrication, transportation, assembly, installation, fastening, monitoring, maintenance, and representation. And I don't think that list is complete. It is as if architecture is now itself, whatever architecture is, whatever it is, is now suspended in clouds of digital precision and calculation. Or to say it another way around, what we used to call buildings have become the visible tips of vast icebergs of data. Um, and it's not just a matter of all of the countless calculations that lead to a building, but certainly this is true, but the building itself is seen as a site of continuous recalculation in a thoroughly electronic life. So buildings are produced and actually live uh, electronically. Uh, by the way, uh, I think that architecture is an incredibly low technology field. I don't know if you can find one that's lower, certainly cooking is much more uh, uh, advanced. Uh, and I, we should be perhaps proud of the fact that we're such a low technology field, low and slow. But even the smallest building has countless parts made of countless materials coming from countless places to form what appears to be a single contained object, but perhaps is more like a kind of a valve, you know, some, uh, uh, that is attached to multiple infrastructures, local, regional, global, and hosting multiple evolving communities of people and other animals, equipment, plants, microbes, and electromagnetic magnetic waves. So maybe the, the building, as it were, sort of, in a way, stands still because everything else is moving and somehow stuff passes through architecture, so it's some kind of uh, valve. It could be that the singularity and stability of buildings, or the apparent stability, is it is it worst, uh, is as, as it were a foil or even a denial of the countless flows that it facilitates, accommodates, filters, or resists? Or to say it just another way around, uh, buildings themselves tend not to flow, even if flow is what they're all about. Now, contemporary discourse casts this, let's say, fact, which I would say is a historical fact, not new, casts this historical fact in terms of computation. Every dimension 
uh, becomes increasingly precise and new dimensions keep getting added. Basically every week there's another way in which one can measure uh, and think about architecture. Contemporary discourse about computation in architecture uh, and architecture and computation, because there might not be such a difference, echoes the discourse about exactitude made by modern architects in the early 20th century. So just to note, first of all, we've heard this before, right? Perhaps the, sh the, the emphasis has shifted, the focus has shifted from, let's say, customization, from standardization to customization, responsiveness, performance, and interactivity, these kinds of things. Yet I would argue that this is ultimately an expansion of the zone of exactitude rather than a transformation. In other words, we've added new, new ideas about transformation. I give one example, the biggest of all, the most influential architect polemicist of the 20th century, Le Corbusier. He loved the word exactitude. Exactitude for him was sort of like a playboy centerfold. It was just an exciting word um, that represented everything that was magical uh, about architecture. And he wanted the new precision, so he said, of industrial techniques to reshape architecture. By the way, this, when I say it's kind of pornographic, I mean, I really mean that, that it's a kind of uh, sexual thing, that numbers are, uh, are uh, erotic. And perhaps, by the way, this whole obsession with exactitude is uh, uh, highly erotically charged and therefore requires, or requires us at this conference, perhaps a more sort of psychoanalytical and, and uh, critical perspective. But just to run you thing, through arguments that you know all too well, but just to remind you how executive plays there. Let's go to Towards an Architecture, 1923, single most influential book of, of, of modern architecture. What's the basic idea? Architects are manly men, manly men. They are healthy, that's the word he uses, physically, aesthetically, mentally, and morally, right? Architects, feminine, unhealthy, uh, detached, uh, uh, dying, right? Uh, the engineer is, why, why is the engineer healthy? Uh, the engineer works with economy, economy of materials, with calculation, with machines, with exactness. Health is exactness. The architect is unhealthy because the architect lacks precision, lacks exactness. But here's the trick. Architects can turn exactness into art, can do something that engineers can't do. So this is the, the main argument of the most influential text, which is architects are losing, they are losers. They can become winners by actually doing even better than the engineers, what the engineers do and, and ultimately transcend. A house, for example, famously is a machine for living in and therefore is exact, is, a, is an object of exactness, plus this additional thing, art, poetry, uh, emotion. What's interesting in, in Le Corbusier's argument is this extra thing, which is architecture itself, is made possible by the technical world that it transcends. That's the nature of his argument. No exactitude, no emotion, no architecture. So in a certain sense, the architect has to pass through exactitude onto the, onto the way towards something else. Uh, the architect, for example, and again, just quoting the same book, has to quote, master construction as exactly as a thinker masters grammar. Or when he speaks of the law of economy, he says pure manifestations of calculation using materials completely and exactly. Uh, he says in the past, houses were made to man's exact measure and we've lost this ability. Now that industry is tying the human to machines, everyone, he says, is being held to an, what he calls an implacable standard of exactness. Each part, he says, must be exact to continue with exactitude its role as a component. So just to be a little player in the big ecology, you must be exact. He speaks of the new forms of exactitude offered by concrete and steel, which adapt themselves perfectly to theory, to, sorry, to, to, th yes, to theory and to calculation. So if you listen to him, he's saying basically um, the scene in which architecture will be born towards an architecture, that which is just ahead of us, is multiple layers of mutually reinforcing exactitude. He makes a list of like 20 different ways that you have to be uh, exact. By the way, being a racist myself, I have to point out that he's Swiss. Right? So you have to sort of hear this love affair, this erotics of exactitude in terms of a whole kind of uh, national uh, cliche, let's say. Right? Of, uh, this is somebody who says that the single most beautiful object in the universe is a filing cabinet. 
and then gives his reasons uh, why this is such a beautiful thing. So this becomes a kind of formula. Let's jump one year to, to a lecture he gave Lesprit Nouveau in architecture, the new spirit in architecture. He says, the house has two purposes. First, it is a living machine, i.e. a machine intended to provide us with assistance for speed and exactitude in the work, an efficient and effective, diligent and considerate machine to meet the requirements of the body, comfort. But then, this is the plus, it is the useful place, still useful, it's, it's, this plus is still in the world of uh, function, useful place for what? Meditation, exactly, which seems to be a disconnection from the mechanical physical world. And finally, the place where beauty exists and brings to the mind the calm that is indispensable. So this obsession with exactitude is, is, is made in the name of a clear, disconnected, meditative sort of spiritual mind. Let's jump again to, to a year later, another lecture with the same title. He says, we, and we could talk here about what does it mean, we here, we need a great constructive exactitude. So even exactitude itself, not just the exact exactitude of construction, but the way in which exactitude itself is a kind of constructive force, right? What he calls a precision of intention and a rigor of absolute reasoning. So you see there's a kind of connection between this idea of the exactitude of the technical machine-like tool that enables you to live uh, and the exactitude of the mind that would be released by that, the freedom of the mind. So one kind of exactitude gives way to ultimately to the exactitude of reasoning. Let's jump another couple of years, the forward to the city of tomorrow. And I'm saying this again and again because you might think I'm kidding you. Um, he says today, our enthusiasm is for exactitude. This is his way to introduce the book. And exactitude, he says, carried to its furthest limits and raised to an ideal, the search for perfection, right? So it's the dream, right? He says, this modern sentiment is a spirit of geometry, a spirit of construction and, and synthesis. Exactitude and order are its essential conditions. Our means are such today that exactitude and order are within our reach. So it's a kind of magical uh, uh, constructive capacity. Let's jump another few years. He writes a book called Precisions. I don't bother to quote you this book. Just think, who else would write a book in which the title is Precisions, right? It's like, got it, you don't have to open it. Uh, it's all about being precise, being exact. Let's jump a few more years, another lecture. A new classification of town building, a new dwelling unit. He says, the construction of the building, which is currently done to the nearest centimeter. So he's saying, this is how exactly a nearest centimeter has now to move into the regime of industrial exactitude to the nearest 10th of a millimeter. So he says, okay, architecture must now in the spirit of the machine be exact to one tenth of a millimeter. Let's go to the first, the introduction to the first volume of the Earth Complet, right? Ambitious boy, Le Corbusier is publishing the first volume as a very young, uh, uh, architect. He says, he begins with a letter about the need for architects to make, and I think it's kind of a beautiful expression, voyages of discovery into exactitude. So exactitude is a sort of a terrain, a sort of a mythical uh, place. And he says, and thereby the beauty of nature and even the perfection of the national, he even says catastrophes, getting back to the lecture about weather, uh, even says uh, one can find in catastrophe the the sort of mathematical beauty uh, of the universe. In order to do what? Uh, banish stupidity, right? So at one end is a stupidity and at the other end is a sort of a mythical world of exactitude. Let's go to the second volume of the Irv Complet. He says the reason he keeps saying the same thing, like the reason he keeps like I'm doing to you, repeat, repeat, repeat. The reason he keeps repeating is quote, he has discovered once and for all and recognized exactitude. In other words, he's been to the holy place of exactitude and can report back to you on what you need to know. And because it's the world of, of exactitude, the story is always the same, because that's the whole point of that story. So Le Corbusier, let's say, uh, is obsessed with exactitude of science, of machines, of calculation, of the engineers, of, of the economy, of industry, of construction, of the law. Again, just a quick example, the, the United States for Le Corbusier is the land of exactitude in its cities, in its skyscrapers, in its stock market, in jazz, in tap, in dancing, everything is about exactitude. Of course, exactitude is just the world of the engineer. It requires the French artist to civilize it and to make it art. So it is, is what he calls a savage world. And the engineer is a savage requiring a kind of 
evolutionary, even a kind of eugenically evolutionary uh, improvement. But here again, all the time, exactitude, even the United States could act with all of its clumsiness and lack of reason and Cartesian uh, uh, precision at the, at the brain level, even this place could act as an incubator uh, for architecture. But again, going very fast. Okay, we got the picture. But he also saw exactitude in classical temples in Japanese woodcuts in medieval cathedrals and Roman city planning. In other words, got nothing to do with modernity as such. This is the key point. For Le Corbusier, architecture was not modern because it was exact. It's not like if you make it exact and you're modern, it was only architecture in which it was exact. So in fact, a modern architecture is not a particular kind of architecture, but is an architecture sensitive and responsive to the exactitude of its time. Right? One could have made a modern architecture in uh, ancient Greece. Right? That if it was, it would be modern if it was with an exactitude of its time. Modern forms of exactness inevitably incubate a modern architecture, right? Even if architects are pathologically slow to recognize their own time. Architecture is kind of a part of the evolution of exactitude. Exactitude is a kind of evolving thing and architecture is, as it were, a symptom of this evolution. It may be a late symptom, a slowly moving symptom, uh, or a slowly moving branch of exactitude, never quite catching up to the logic of the exact sciences. And it seems to me we can, can listen to Alejandro in terms of this relationship of the exact science and what, what this would mean as a kind of lure pulling architecture in a certain direction. Now, what's his proof? The Parthenon, the most modern building of all. He says it's a machine for stirring emotion, right? So a machine, technical exactitude, which is going to give way to something non-technical. He says of the Parthenon, fractions of a millimeter come into play when discussing the proportions of the building. He says the curve of the columns are, quote, as rational as that of a large artillery shell. So what's exciting about the Parthenon is it's so precise, so exact. He says, to quote him, the whole of this plastic mechanics is realized in marble with the rigor that we have learned to apply in machines. The impression is one of cut and polished steel. In the Parthenon, he says, everything is stated exactly. So it's not just exact, it's stated exactly. Its exactness is as it were on display, is performed as uh, uh, such. If we go to a 1946 text, he uses another very beautiful expression. He, he refers to the frightening exactitude of the Parthenon. Frightening because it's so exact uh, uh, for something so old. Comparable, he says, in the size and facing of its marble to the very size of machine tools. Rigor and exactitude are the means of the solution, the cause of the character, the reason for uh, harmony. Right? Um, so Le Corbusier is basically calling for architecture to be as precise as any other machine within one-tenth of a millimeter, uh, according to him, but you will recognize that that's more or less the same dimension that the Parthenon uh, uh, had reached. Um, this this, this uh, uh, key thing, though, is that is like the Parthenon, a modern architecture has to flaunt its exactitude. It has to not just be exact, but has to make a kind of display of it. And this is the thoroughly, let's say, classical ambition uh, of modern architecture. This was, uh, in turn, part of an even longer and less for forward, straight, uh, less straightforward history of exactitude in architecture. We don't have time, but just to give you some uh, greatest hits, 1682, the famous uh, book of Desgade, measured all the ancient ruins of the monuments to the accuracy of 2.25 millimeters. And this was considered absolutely shocking, and people couldn't believe that he managed to accomplish this. It was immediately used in the treatise of Claude Perrault to demonstrate that the supposed exactitude, using his word, of classical architecture didn't exist. Therefore, there was a need for a formulation of rules on quote unquote scientific basis. In other words, presumed exactitude uh, a collapse in the face of scientific exactitude. I could give you, if we had more time, uh, a kind of timeline of all the dimensions that architects offer as to what is the precise amount of exactitude uh, that's needed. I, like Alejandro, I jumped to Buckminster Fuller in a lecture called All That I Know. By the way, this was a lecture in which he had a rule, which is if he repeated himself, he had to stop. It went for seven days, just to give you a sense. Um, a six-hour lecture from Fuller was what he called a mini lecture, uh, just to give you a sense. 
So he's talk, talking about the Ford, the dome he did for the Ford Motor Company in 1953. He says, in dimensioning of buildings, even today, as the workmen put it together, a quarter of an inch is a pretty good tolerance. But if you're building buildings for an automobile, you can't have anything like that. So the automobile men are down to 10 thousandths of an inch. In building airplanes today and in the space of rocketry, where mild variations and enormous velocities are going to built in errors, they're dealing with one millionth of an inch. So in this history of architects referring to dimensions, we at least get to the point of one millionth of an inch. And he says, but in the building world, it's still a quarter of an inch kind of stuff. And the kind of stuff is the, is the put down, right? I couldn't have any such nonsense uh, as what I was really trying to do was to get into geodesics. So I was really out to see how I could really reduce stresses in for, uh, reduce stress and forces. So we kept our tolerance to ten thousandths of an inch. So again, if if Tesco Day was two point two five millimeters and Luca is one tenth of a millimeter, okay, now we're at ten thousandth of an inch, and that was in nineteen fifty three. In all of these cases, this display of exactitude this kind of uh, um, attraction to exactitude, which is something very different from being exact. Right? So this is, not, this is not simply about being exact. This is, about, this is people talking about the exactness of architecture. And I don't know about you, but if an architect says something to me, I tend to take it with a little uh, grain or two of uh, salt. Uh, architects are speaking about ambition, right? desire. So there is a desire for these, this level of exactness. But this desire to be exact, which is different from actually being exact, was, has always been more or less directly, perhaps not even more or less, but really exactly uh, linked to an authoritarian rhetoric of control, of order, of purity, and of cleanliness. Uh, again, I could give you uh, countless examples. Just to take one, the decorative art of today, look at Ruzier again, 1925, a machine has an exactitude found in nature, an aesthetic of purity of exactitude. So exactitude is, is purity. Uh, this is, of course, exemplified in Le Corbusier's concept of exact air, that we shouldn't be breathing the air of the outside of a building. We should be re breathing a, a totally purified uh, air of a single temperature, uh, purified of bacteria, excluding microbial others from the interior, along with any external variations of temperature and moisture. You could say that exact, or I'm going to say exactitude was explicitly linked to an extractive logic of service and slavery that systematically pushes multiple others outside and down. After all, nested inside the question of exactitude is the question of tolerance. Buildings are multiple nested sets of tolerance with an arsenal of material and techniques that are constantly deployed to conceal any inexactitude of movement. In other words, if there's this whole obsession about exactitude and the need to display it, this really translates as the incredible need to repress any in, in exactitude, right? So architecture is dominated by the attempt to constrain any inexactitude revealed in gaps, undulations, leaks, or squeaks. The whole discipline of architecture is dependent on an amazing arsenal of gaskets and talkings to reveal tolerances, to veil tolerances, and to sustain the illusion of a static object. By the way, if architecture is static, it falls down immediately. So actually, in order to be, to represent stability, it has to move, but this is another case. A very, very large part of the canonic treatises of figures like Vitruvius and Alberti are devoted to the precise production, mixture, and application of successive layers of lime plaster and final policy polishing to avoid, in Alberti's word, defects, gaps, blemishes, swellings, sinkings, splittings, spittings, warps, and cracks. These are the enemies of architecture. And you have to produce a, quote, smooth, square, level, and plumb white surface that holds the, beholds the beholders, beholder's eye on what is exact. So as with Luca Rizier, of course, exactitude of point, line, and surface depend entirely on the ancient craft of plaster. Uh, uh, let's go to Alberti. For everything that must be reduced to exact measure, so all the parts may correspond with one another, with nothing that may blemish this, and exact angles and exact lines. Let's, let us, in short, make sure that everything is measured and put together with the greatest exactness of lines. And then he has vast chapters devoted to how to hide any inexactness in those very same lines. 
So tolerance is, of course, calculated intolerance. Tolerance is not how precise your building is, but how loose your, your building appears to be. Intolerance to unwanted movements, bacteria, insects, species, temperatures, smell, and, de and most importantly, designated others. Uh, tolerance is precisely not hospitality. Uh, it is the lack of tolerance. Uh, architecture is even a form of intolerance. For some, it's the very form of intolerance. It's what intolerance looks like. Or to say it another way around, intolerance always produces an architecture. Um, it, yet it's, it's a mistake, I think, to simply counter in industrial and now electronic exactitude with sort of appeals to uh, creativity, imagination, humanity, you know, sort of lost, lost uh, 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 treasures. All of the counter discourses to the discourse of exactitude, all of the counter discourses, and there are many, they even accompany the development of exactitude in modern architecture. These accompanying discourses uh, that oppose the emergence of a modern industrialized architecture as a mode of calculation and critiqued it by privileging the body, social life, locality, identity, religion, poetry, history, nature, and all these things, were in my opinion, simply rival claims on the exact. In other words, they were claiming to have the real exactitude in their hands rather than in the technical exactitude in the hands of the, of the engineers. Again, one quick example, Ruskin. No one loved cracks and stains weathering more than Ruskin. Right? Um, and no one was more skeptical of machines. He was convinced that as humans get tied to machines, they become machines and everything is lost. There was a delay in the publication of the first volume of The Stones in Venice, and this allowed him to add a critique of the Crystal Palace, which was just being opened for the very first time and was not only the uh, kind of emblem of the emergence of modern architecture in the hands of most historians of modern architecture, but is in Ruskin's hand, the kind of beginning of the end uh, of anything good in, in architecture. Why? Because it's mathematical calculation. It's architecture reduced to calculation. He complained, by the way, also about the fact that people who love the architecture, pre-modern architecture, restore it with what he calls mathematical exactitude. Uh, and he absolutely opposed the preser historic preservation movement that precisely replaces the damaged, weathered parts of existing architecture. But it would be wrong to think of Ruskin as simply anti-exactitude. His very first visit to Venice, getting back to this question of Venice, a visit in which he says he discovered, fell in love with architecture for the first time, he spent four days desperately trying to draw the facade of, of, of one particular palazzo, in a way that would capture its stains and cracks. His way of drawing, as you probably know, was, was an attempt to document the factual evidence of the facade. Um, he, and he wanted to document the cracks and the stains, but also the weeds. He says, I have all the measures of this building, of all the moldings, and that is something, but I can't get on with the general view. The beauty of it is in the cracks and in the stains, and to draw these out is impossible. I'm absolutely in despair. So he just enormously frustrated that he could not be exact enough. And actually, another tourist was running out of money, so sold him some daguerreotypes, some photographs of the very same facade. And he was thrilled, he says, he says a couple of days later, and anybody who's worked and blundered and stammered as I have for four days, and then sees the thing that he's been trying to do for so long, so vainly and so unsuccessfully, now done perfectly and faultlessly in half a minute, would never abuse uh, this machine again. So he, he actually uses a machine to capture the very pre-machine logic that he was interested. He says it's very nearly the same thing as carrying off the palace it itself. Every chip of stone and stain is there. And of course, there's no mistake about the proportions. So, so the whole point here is, is his claim against the machine is not simply about against the exactitude of the machine. It's a claim for another exact exactitude. And if you read Ruskin, he's a lover of different forms uh, of, of exactitude. He argues, for example, that no craftsperson would ever produce a work using measurements. That's not really a craftsperson. Uh, and he and opposes this as a sort of machine-like behavior, but then discusses the very, very precise measurements that you could make of the work of such a uh, uh, craftsperson. So if, if Le Corbusier talks about mechanical exactitude and then smuggles in a kind of logic of emotion and so on, Ruskin goes exactly the other way around. He, and I'm sorry for the sort of uh, symmetry of this, but in, again, in Alejandro's honor, symmetry, right? So symmetry would suggest that Ruskin's discussion of emotion turns out to be quite mathematical uh, in the end. 
even there's an exactitude of feeling. I, qu I quote you Ruskin on himself. My life has chanced to be one of gradual progress, so let's say evolution, in the thing, or scientific evolution, in the things which I began with a childish voice. I can measure with almost mathematical certitude the degree of feeling with which more or less greater degrees of wealth or skill affect my mind. So even his uh, work and his life, his feelings, are something that he can measure mathematically. So just to sort of uh, hit into uh, just a minute or two on Conrad Baxman as advertised, this of course complicates the question of tolerance, which is really the question of intolerance. The intolerance that shapes, that gives birth to architecture, the intolerance that is arguably the central mission uh, of architecture. I just want to quickly point to one of, I think, many architects who just can't tolerate architecture itself. But the thing that really makes them sick is architecture itself, right? this very, very uh, project. And in particular, I talk about Conrad Baxman, who tried to use the very same logic of industrialized and even electronic exactitude to dissolve architecture itself, to design the exit of architecture. He considered this to be the ultimate task of the anti-architect is to sort of design the way in which architecture would leave in the name of an extreme uh, uh, hospitality. So we're going to go fast. Uh, my favorite image of Vaxman. Um, uh, he's in a foundry testing uh, uh, the, mo the, the recently forged elements of a, of a system for uh, an aircraft hangar. So it's a kind of image of a practical person. Uh, everybody always thinks of, of uh, Vaxman as a kind of a doer, as a kind of practical embedded person, one of the greatest experts of industrialized architecture an expert in joints, an ex an originally trained as a, as a carpenter, so an expert in the way things are put together. The people that love Vaxman, and there are many, in a certain sense, think that he holds architecture together, that getting back to this question about the tectonic, if you, if you are the caretaker of the idea of the joint, then you might be the caretaker of architecture. But what, what that tradition uh, uh, overlooks is that, in fact, this figure, almost always smoking, as you can see here, wanted architecture itself to become as ephemeral as that cigarette smoke. Because if architecture was like smoke, then it would be genuinely uh, hospitable, genuinely open to a future, to a shocking, surprising future uh, uh, in, in this way. I show you one example of this. This is, of course, the most famous of the Vaxman projects. This is the vast uh, space frame air for the um, United States Air Force, a, ha a hangar project. You see that it hangs there uh, like a cloud, not by accident. It sort of floats there. It has no element of a traditional building, no floor, no walls, uh, no ceiling, no windows, no, no uh, doors. But it has the possibility of all those things. It hits the ground very light, like some huge insect. I mean, maybe this is an aircraft hangar, or maybe this is an aircraft. When you look at it, are you looking at something that just landed and is about to take off? It's trying to be there as little as possible, even though it would be the biggest building on the planet if it was built, right? It's enormous, right? And has no theoretical end. You can, you can increase this thing. Here we are looking at sideways. We're just looking at a model of one section of it. You have no idea of the size. It's based on this detail. Totally agree with Alejandro. The, 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 the center of Axman's philosophy is it's all about the, the detail. In this case, it's this particular detail, which allows up to 21 tubes to meet at one place, one hollow, one point in space, as Vaxman would point it, at any angle, at any time, and can be assembled uh, with just one blow of a hammer and uh, taken apart uh, uh, again the same way. This is the joint. If you're into tectonics, uh, you love this. You love this uh, 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 image, the details, the thing itself. This is how it looks. Sorry, we had some sound bouncing around. This is the thing. These are the objects. It's actually a kind of a weave, right? A kind of a carpet, a kind of a open frame system. The human is almost nothing. 
looking at this is like looking at a volcano or it's like something like the sublime, something impossible to understand. One doesn't know if this is, is, is the work of an alien species or this is actually the species that the human uh, has become, right? Or again, even the biggest aircraft in the world, these are the aircraft designed to drop nuclear weapons anywhere in the world, anytime, anywhere, right? So horrific technology. Even this horrific technology appears more familiar, more acceptable than this vast frame. Right? There's no real place for the human here. Just you see one person in one little platform, sort of vestigial platform, you see it in the drawing. Baxman feels very much that he's working in the spirit of of Paxton and the Crystal Palace. This Crystal Palace, again, a building that has the aspiration to be invisible. The model is so precise that the structural calculations, which were originally done on the full-scale mock-up, are then done on this uh, model. Here's Vaxman with the mock-up, but actually the mock-up is not as good as the model. This is the model underway, being constructed. These are the students making the model. This is Vaxman absolutely amazed at this model. It's not like he knew what this thing would be. This was as shocking to him as it would be to anybody that visited it. They look at it perplexed, mystified by their own production, amazed, confused, overwhelmed, right? It produces these sort of hypnotically detailed uh, drawings, kind of psychedelic drawings. If a drawing could be a drug, this is a drug, right? A sort of destabilizing of everything that you ever thought that architecture uh, could be in a kind of breathtaking layering, right? It's exactitude, it's exactitude, 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 but exactitude in the name of what was, would be ultimately uh, a cloud, right? a hovering cloud. When Vaxman sits beside it, he appears to sit beside it as the architect, but look at his face, he's shocked. Has no idea, what have I done, right? What, what is this thing? What will it do next? Uh, more like this when the first model was made. So you, I think you hear enough from me. What, what I'm trying to argue is something as simple as, Baxman, perhaps unlike any other architect, I think Buckminster Fuller is the, is the, let's say the rival to this claim, pursues the logic of exactitude to its limit. And what Fuller and Baxman had in common is the ultimate uh, infinite extension of exactitude is the invisibility of architecture and a kind of openness to the sort of electromagnetic spectrum in which we all exist as kind of very transitional uh, temporary uh, beings and ever more so um, in this conversation today. Thank you so much. I'm trying to take the screen away, but maybe you have to do it for me. Um, let me see. Here we go. Great, thanks. Thank you so much. So uh, there's one question, and then if we have time, we'll get to our own questions. Um, so an anonymous attendee is saying, thank you, Mark, I hear in your argument an agreement with Jeremy Till's notion of the contingent. Till tasks, sorry, talks, excuse me, I'm getting tired, talks about the risk of modernism's drive for exactness and purity, which results in the extreme as fascism. And at the very least is naive. He cites Corbusier's derision of the filth and irregularity of the train station at Bordeaux, where he caught the train on his way to Pressac, Corp's perfect example of modern workers' housing. Years later, Pressac was modified, planted, painted bright colors, all out of the hands of architect and perhaps ultimately more exact by your definition of Vexman. Yeah, okay. I, I, um... I agree with all of this, except, um, my, you know, Vaxman is, is a refugee uh, uh, from the Second World War, specifically from the Holocaust, which is, uh, which is, which is murdering his mother, sister, family, right? So, so behind Vaxman's argument is a complete loss of faith in in humanity, 
right? And, and a call for architecture to be other. So I'm really trying to oppose any simple association between exactitude and the kind of criminality of authoritarian uh, regimes. I rather say there's a kind of e e ecology, let's say, of different concepts of exactitude. And uh, there is possible transgressive concepts of exactitude that are, uh, are, are meant as, as, as a kind of uh, liberation uh, towards a new society. You know, you know these, these, this image is, is, the paradox is obvious, right? That it's a nuclear shelter, it's a shelter for nuclear bombers, right? But it is imagined and presented as the possibility of, an, of, of a kind of uh, architecture without architects. And, and without architecture, right? It, anything becomes possible there. It's kind of modern architecture on steroids. So it's a little bit like if you're unbelievably modern in the classical way, you end up in the space of Fuller and Waxman. So suddenly, uh, exactitude takes on an, an, another model. I say all this because it's got a lot, a lot more to, it's more than just simply the absence of the figure of the architect. And I don't celebrate anti-architecture because the figure of the architect is gone. I celebrate the fact that architecture is gone and whatever we call the architect has to become uh, something else. This is the spirit in which I in, enjoy very much and respect Alejandro's talk. He's trying to engineer, you could say, a different set of responsibilities and a different focus for the, for the architect. But I agree with Jeremy's the sort of tone of it. The sort of anti, yeah, how can you make the biggest building in the world that's an anti-monument? You know, like how do, how do you pull that off? But by the way, just as a footnote, the, uh, Vaxman was absolutely inspirational for the radical avant-garde of the 60s. There's hardly a single Japanese, Italian, German, Austrian, English. The entire avant-garde is devoted to Vaxman. But we don't think of him as a radical um, because we have a nostalgic, we cling nostalgically to certain ideas about architecture. And I think if you just look at and listen to him, you realize why the radicals regarded you know, we're just so um, energized by this devastation of architecture. Sorry for going so long. Okay, we have another question. Um, and um, this one says, different kinds of exactitude. This seems like a key component to this discussion. For instance, in praise of shadows can be said to be a different kind of exactitude. Are some exactitudes gentler than others, or does each one become oppressive in its own way? Uh, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> um, I suppose because I think that that exactitude is a desire, right? It's a kind. It's a kind of. Uh, it's an aesthetic desire. So it's 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 uh, not about. It's it's a kind of ambition. It's kind of a, an aesthetic project. Um, if you, if you look at the uh, Neolithic houses that are made with all these layers of glass that I'm talking about, that was the, that was the leading edge of technology. That, was the, that required almost all of the energy of the community that was newly settled. It's what enabled the community to, 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 to settle. So it's an aesthetic project and it was an aesthetic project. The, the Neolithic dwellings, the last layer of plaster is unbelievably white and polished. Right? So it's an aesthetic project. That doesn't mean it's sort of light and delicate and not, not absorbing vast amounts of uh, energy. So, so I say it's an aesthetic project. You could argue that, um, uh, you know, the, the, the most uh, uh, oppressive symptoms of our society are also in their very violence, a fundamentally aesthetic project. Uh, so I say it's an aesthetic project by which I mean, then, then I'm not gonna go in there and say, this exactitude is good, this one's bad. It's more how these rival concepts of exactitude um, kind of compete uh, to rule, rule the kind of uh, discourse. I, again, I'm speaking too fast, but what, what if you just look at all the current political debate that we don't want to talk about and you say, I just, I just want to underline every sentence that everybody says that's got something to do with exactitude. Um, and I just don't think there's anything left. It's all about that. It's a debate about, it's, you have an entire election on the question of whiteness. That's it. 
There was no other issue. And in that debate, everybody uh, thinks they have exactitude. And, it, you know, then following Alejandro, we have to say, well, what do the machines think? What are they, what are they doing with whiteness right now? Like, you know, so which way are they going to go? Which way are they going to vote? And I have, I have kind of an open-ended question and comment that in a way, I think the way you've described this quest for exactitude as a, as a, as a way of trying to kind of control or understand intolerance is something that definitely also relates to the ways we draw. And we talked a little bit about how we drew previously and how we draw now. And I think a lot of the current ways or the current platforms always sell themselves and present themselves as a way of being able to um, somehow um, embody this sense of exactitude. And uh, of course, um, they represent anything but in a way. So it's interesting to kind of think about that in terms of um, issues of representation and drawing as well. Yeah, so just quickly, I, I, I um, you know, by the way, you have, you know, Francesca Hughes is the expert right, on this question. So I just can say a couple of things and then you'll hear the really much more nuanced argument. But um, most of the discourse about computation in this battle for exactitude makes a promise that it's able to move the question of exactitude into time. So, so I can respond to environmental conditions to produce an object that itself can respond to environmental conditions. So basically you, you, you offer a kind of packages of exactitude that are all interlocked and you claim therefore your victory over somebody who, somebody who simply makes one drawing, and, uh, one uh, object. So it's, it's, it's an argument to be taken very, very seriously and and it has to be taken seriously because precisely the world that we live in is such a world in other words exactitude is always operating in time and architecture the, the, the kind of architecture that Vaxman wants to assassinate tries to produce an image of stability um, in in a world which is not stable and you know it's very hard to find straight lines uh, and right angles in the so-called natural world. In fact, it's just so, so architecture sets itself up as an astonishing artifice, right? And then, and then the computational army has found a way to, to um, hold on to stability by grabbing what seems to be its opposite, which is, you know, mobility, but to, as it were, stabilize the analysis of this world. So of course it's it's potentially enormous. Number one, incredibly important because actually the world is that way, not the way architects uh, think about it. And in a certain sense, architects architects are faced with this sort of decision: do we maintain the logic of denial, which has been our main trade since ten thousand years, to to make an object that that simply doesn't participate in the world that it wishes to exclude? So it's a very exclusionary. So architecture is a very exclusionary system. But do we maintain this logic of exclusion, which means in a hyper computational world of endless movement and endless data, we need to be even more exclusionary than uh, before? Or do you jump in and swim with the data? And you can see architects taking the two sides. And it's certainly not a decision between progressive and conservative, even in, in Alejandro's sense. You can be totally obnoxious in both uh, <laughs> camps. And, you know, since most of our friends are architects, I mean, there's quite a stockpile of obnoxiousness in our field. Mm 